Hey guys, welcome again to Catalyst. Um, so we have another kind of guest speaker, if you will, but also not guest in the same way. Uh, so Jack Kirschbaum, most of you know him, is going to be preaching for us tonight. Um, last year, uh, Jack uh, approached me and we talked about how uh, he has a passion for ministry and for teaching God's word and um, even has thoughts of maybe being uh, a preaching pastor someday. Um, and he asked if he could uh, preach at a Catalyst. And so um, this past year, we've really been talking about and, and working through how to preach and how to preach a sermon. And uh, I'm excited for him to come up and preach to you. He's very well prepared. And uh, it's going to be a good message from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So make sure and thank him for the many hours that he's put in. Um, but other than that, let's, let's, uh, let's turn it over to Jack and, and uh, turn over in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15. Thanks. Can you guys hear me? Thanks. I like it in my face. What's going on, everyone? As Nathaniel mentioned, I'm Jack. Um, I'm a senior here, been here for a while. Um, before I start, I just wanted to thank Nathaniel, Shandy, Mo, and Nick for allowing me to do this. Um, as Nathan Nathaniel said, I came to him last summer. Um, God just put it on my heart to actually teach. Um, and uh, the main reason for that was my family really aren't believers, so I've been trying to edit, um, edit eloquently tell them the gospel. Um, so again, I just wanted to thank them. I also wanted to thank everybody that's been praying for me the past few weeks. Um, I've told a multitude of people that I was pretty nervous, and um, I really didn't want to come up here and just preach heresy. So um, thanks for all that. I've been praying about that. Um, so if, I have version available too, so if you guys have that app, you can go to it, go to events, and then click Christian Campus Fellowship or whatever, and you can follow along there. So before I start, I kind of want to go through just what we've learned so far in 1 Corinthians, um, the first 14 chapters. So the best way I can describe it is in the beginning when the apostles started their missions, they broke their missions down into two categories. One was orthopraxy and one was an orthodoxy teaching style. An orthopraxy style, I want to get this right, so I'm going to read it directly off here is the correct practice or the true practices that we as Christians continually act and continually conduct, right? And orthodoxy is the correct belief we as Christians or the truths we as Christians believe in. So thus far in 1 Corinthians uh, chapters 1 through chapter 14 has been orthopraxy, um, practices that we need to learn and we need to act out within the church. This chapter, chapter 15, is the first orthodoxy chapter, you could say. Um, so, oh, just to give you guys an example, so um, Adam preached on uh, prophecy in tongues and then roles of women in the church, right? And Chris, a few weeks back, talked about practices that are used to build up the church in general. So as you can see, that's orthopraxy. Um, so I'm going to start preaching um, 1 Corinthians 15 right now if you guys want guys want to turn there with me. Um, so pretty much just the layout. Um, I have 34 verses to get through, so I'm going to pretty much just chunk it. Uh, we're going to go through 1 through 11, 12 through 19, 20 through 28, and then 29 through 34. And um, we'll read a chunk, talk about each verse, give you some sort of, you know, um, main point out of it that's in the version, so you can follow along. So if you get lost, we can, uh, you can catch up, because I'll say those probably verbatim. So I'm going to start by reading 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 11. I'm reading out of the ESV. Um, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom who are still alive. The and those some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preached and so we believed. So, the first thing that I want to do is 
we need to figure out who, he, uh, who Paul is actually talking to, right? So you can tell this by specific tenses of verbs he uses in the scripture. So as you can see um, in, verse, in verse 1 and in verse 2, he uses um, the word received, uh, being in the past tense, obviously. So he's talking to people that have already received the gospel, right? So um, then the transitional after that, in which you stand and following, it says you are being saved. So he's talking about people that are continually standing in the faith, uh, receiving God's grace. So he's talking to Christians pretty much. So if we go to verses three to four, um, Paul starts right off by saying of first importance. So obviously it is the most important thing they've ever heard, right? Um, this pretty much, as you can see by the title heading, is about the resurrection of Christ. So um, pretty much Paul is proving to the Corinthians the truth and validity of Christ resurrecting, in turn proving the validity of Christianity. That's one through 11. So three, for four, three uh, through four, he mentions um, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. If you guys want to do this uh, and look back, but I'm not going to read it all, Isaiah 53 is fulfilled. The prophecy is fulfilled by those specific words. Um, and we can go to, uh, he also mentions um, being raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That obviously refers to the gospels. Verses 5 through 8, the whole section is Paul explaining and defending the resurrection of Christ through witness testimony. So right now he uses the scriptures to prove it. You don't believe the scriptures? Let's use witness testimony, right? So he names people, Peter, the disciples, 500 at the ascension of the Spirit. That's in Acts, if you guys want to check that out. James, his brother, the apostles, and then finally Paul himself. So right now we have the scriptures prove Jesus resurrecting. We have eyewitness testimonies. Paul also, also mentions that most of them are still alive, so you could, in the time, go and ask them about it. And finally, um, the ascension, all the apostles, and finally Paul. So then 9 through 11, um, Paul brings his own testimony into it to prove that it actually has shaped someone and transformed something or someone, right? So um, he validates, he tells how the resurrection of Christ validated um, himself in God. Um, and he's, he explains that, you know, he persecuted church, so he was the most unworthy. So if the resurrection of Christ is true and God can work through that, why can't he also, you know, forgive those people that are unworthy? And then he finally ends the section with what Nathaniel, what Nathaniel preached on um, way early last semester was that the message is always the messenger. So Paul pretty much um, says, if not me or if not I, you would have heard it from some, someone else, right? So the main point that I wanted to get out of this, and I'm, I've said it a lot, is the resurrection of Christ is, as Paul would say, of the first importance to the validity of the Christian faith, right? So the main title of it, I said, uh, is resurrection or bust. So I don't know if many of you are football fans, but um, if you play fantasy football or if you know the game of football, you have specific players, usually a wide receiver, um, who goes and catches the ball from the quarterback. Um, and we refer to him as either a boom or a bust if he always goes for like a deep pass. So, you know, um, a good example is a guy named Brandon Cooks. You can look him up. But um, he is a boomer bust. He either does really, really well, he goes super deep, catches a pass, and it's worth like 85 yards or something like that. Or he does nothing the whole game, and he's kind of a bust. His career is kind of, eh, you know, it's not really valid anymore, you could say. Um, so that's what I'm trying to get at. It's the resurrection or bust. The resurrection of Christ is either true or it's not true. Christianity is either true or it's not true. And we as Christians know that it's true. Uh, so I'm going to go on to the next section, but, before, but first I want to kind of get you guys in a mindset here. Um, so who here has ever thought, like, what if? Like, if I made a decision, you ever think, like, oh, what if, you know, I, choose some, I chose something else? Um, so, for example, you know, what if I didn't come to S&T? I wouldn't be here, right? Um, what if I... Um, what if I actually studied for an exam that I did pretty poorly on? Maybe the outcome would have been different, right? And um, what if the Chicago Bears were a good football team? Maybe I would not cry when they lose by 40. That's a, that's a good one. Um, so as you can see, you know, I think of it as um, kind of trivial things, maybe not, not big life decisions, but things like, oh, maybe I should be a fan of a better team, or maybe I should have actually studied to do well on a test. So this is exactly what Paul is doing in the next, next section. He's kind of uh, proposing these what-if statements. So I'm going to read um, 12 through 19 now. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how come some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? 
But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you, have, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this, own, in this life only, we are all people most to be pitied. So some cultural context here. At the time, the Greeks did not believe in an afterlife. They did not believe in our spirits being raised or being eternal by any means. Um, so they believed the human body was just a bondage, and once you died, you pretty much died. There was nothing else. So pretty much Paul in this whole section in a nutshell is saying, if you don't believe that yourself can be resurrected, that you have an eternal spirit, why can you say Jesus, also a man, um, was able to resurrect? So in, through, in verses 12 through 19, um, the whole section, the best way I can do it for you guys or make it clear to you guys is that if-then statement, that what-if. Um, and uh, so I made seven what-if or if-then statements to put those verses in context and to make it a little bit more clear. So I'm going to read those and um, we'll see if they make sense. So verses 12, 13, and 16 we can pretty much say, what if the resurrection of the dead is false? Then Christ himself was not raised. So if the resurrection of the dead is false, then Christ himself was not raised. Resurrection of the dead refers to human sinners dying. Um, so whenever I say resurrection of the dead, I'm referring to us. So 12 through 13, 16. If the resurrection of the dead is false, then Christ himself was not raised. The second one is in verse 14. If the resurrection of Christ is false, then our message is empty. Vain is a synonym to emptiness or um, worthlessness. Um, also in 14, if the resurrection is false, then our faith is in vain, or our faith is meaningless and worthless. Verses 15 through 16, if the resurrection is false, then we are all liars. He's pretty much calling, um, he's saying that the Corinthians are calling God a liar. We're mi misrepresenting God, pretty much calling him a liar which isn't good. If the res uh, verse 17, if the resurrection is false, then we are all lost in our sin. If Christ didn't rise, we would all be dead, and this world would be pretty, pretty horrible, even more sinful. Verse 18, if the resurrection is false, then the dead are lost. So he's referring to um, Christians that believed previously and, then, and are now dead. Um, so those people that believed and were dead and believed that they did have an eternal spirit, it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. They're just gone. And then finally, verse 19, if the resurrection is false, false then we are to be pitied. So my main point uh, that you guys can get out of this is the resurrection of Christ and the resurrection of the dead are a one-two punch. That's kind of my saying. It's a one-two punch. If the resurrection of the dead is denied, we must also deny the resurrection of Christ. So the best analogy or illustration I could think of was something as simple as boxing. Um, so, you know, if you're, I, I'm not a boxing fan by any means, but I am smart enough to know that in boxing, you can't just use one hand. So you have to use both punching hands to knock them out, right? So you need a one-two punch. You need to follow one punch up with another, as, it, as we should follow up Christ's resurrection with our resurrection also. So as of right now, we have gone through 1 through 11, and Paul is talking about an event that happened in the past. He was kind of taking a flashback. In 12 through 19, he was kind of jumping forward into that what-if scenario that I was talking about. So he's kind of looking into the future. In 3, my main, my main point is called reality check, God wins. So we're coming back to reality. We're getting rid of all those the, uh, theoretical um, sayings, the what-if sayings, and we're getting back to historical facts and um, Christianity, Chris, Christian facts. So I'm going to read 20 through 28, and then we'll go from there. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be al made alive. 
but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God, the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is expected, accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him that God may be all in all. Okay, Whew. subjection, a lot. All right. So bear with me. Um, I'm going to try to be as clear as possible here because this one was kind of tough. So we'll start in verse 20. Historically, first fruits meant um, it was a sign that the harvest was to come. So Paul is using a good analogy here. Christ is the first fruit, and the harvest to come is us being resurrected as Christ was resurrected, right? So um, we'll go to verse 21 through 22. He uses Adam to represent men and women who are dead in their sin as Adam was the first to sin. And finally, he says, however, if you're made alive in Christ, um, you'll be made alive. Or if you believe in Christ, you'll be made alive. So verses 23 through 28 are a little bit murky. So the best way I can do it is break it down into a timeline. He's talking about the end times right now. So the first event that happened, the major event that has been the whole entire section thus far, has been what? The resurrection of Christ. That's the, that's the first event, the first fruit, right, that I just mentioned. This has already clearly happened. Then he goes into a time of where we are right now. Um, we are Christians on this earth trying to fulfill the Great Commission to the best of our ability and spread the gospel to people of all nations. The second main event that comes is Christ finally returns. And this is throughout all of 23 through 28. I'm just giving a brief snapshot of it in a nutshell so, um, because I can't go through verse by verse and try to explain it to you guys. Um, so the second event is when Christ finally returns. This will follow the time that we are in right now, obviously, because that's what we're waiting for. The third event that will follow is his reign, um, his 1,000-year reign. That's debatable, but in uh, Revelation, I think it's made pretty clear. Uh, we can talk about that some other time, but we're not going to get into that tonight. Christ will reign with his saints, his Christian believers. Saints is equivalent to Christians. And during this stage, God will be, or Jesus will be, reigning, and he will be trying to knock down all, all authority and dominion that is evil in this world. And finally, the, thir the third event is when God defeats death in the end, and we are in his eternal reign. <coughs> so that's verses 23 through 28. My main point in this section is hitting on that first major event, um, the resurrection of Christ, because that is exactly what we have been talking about the entire time thus far. Um, so the main point is the resurrection is the first major event or the jump start that will lead to God winning in the end. We will be there with him because we are Bible-believing Christians. So I've used two sports illustrations or analogies, so I'm going to use a little lighthearted one here. Who here has seen the movie A Cinderella Story with Hilary Duff and Chad Michael Murray? Yeah. All right, cool. I've seen it too, several times. And um, yeah, guilty pleasure. Um, so that movie is a classic Cinderella story. It's kind of in modern times, you could say. Uh, this girl lost her dad, and she's with her stepmom, who is seen to be evil. She's with her two stepsisters that also seem to be evil. And um, she is kind of overlooked all the time, uh, you could say. But of course, she runs into the man of her dreams, and they... Uh, <laughs> And, um, thanks, Mo. And um, she runs into the man of her dreams, and he just doesn't know who she is. And then, spoiler alert, they um, find out who each other are, and he accepts her for who she is. And it's just a love story. It's great. And they go off to school together, and it's wonderful. But what I'm trying to get at is the first major event in that movie that actually brought them together. It was the Princeton chat room. It was instant messaging. If you don't believe me, go look it up. Um, they both had a dream to go to the Princeton University, right? And they met in a chat room online. And that's the first major event of the entire movie. People overlook it, but it's the first major event in the movie. This, in turn, is the resurrection. The resurrection is the first major event in all of Christianity, right? It's 
It's the leading and start off point, the jump start point of God eventually winning in the end and us being there with him. Some may say that we need the resurrection in order to be with God in the end. I don't think anybody would disagree. Um, so now I'm going to go into verses 29 through 34, and I'll read those now. Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? Why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from the drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. So, I want to hit on one major thing here before I go into the meat of it. The first verse, 29. Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? Um, some people, um, not Christians, but some people believe that this is a practice called proxy baptism. Um, as I said earlier, literally a sentence ago, Christians do not believe this. This is an unbiblical practice, and it has never been taught or practiced by any Christians at any time. I say this because there is a group, the Mormons, that do this, claim to be Christians, and we hold very different truths. If you guys want to talk more about that and you think Christians or Mormons and Christians line up and there's a continue continuity there, we can talk. I know James Wetzel is more than happy to talk about Mormons, so uh, you can hit him up too. I want to make that very evident and very clear. Um, the Mormon church in this practice is unbiblical, and it's not true. Um, that begs the question, so what does it mean, right? So scholars haven't settled this exactly, um, but just reading through commentaries, um, they did come to one specific interpretation that, in my opinion, again, this is just my opinion, is the best interpretation. Pretty much what I think Paul is just saying is, why baptize? The dead is referring to us, right? We are the ones that are dead. So I think he's trying to say is, why baptize anyone, and you being dead in your sin and not having an eternal um, spirit, why baptize anyone at all if the resurrection isn't true? Why tell people about the gospel if it's not true? Um, so that's what I kind of got from that. Um, we can talk about it more one-on-one -on -one if you guys really are passionate about it. Um, but that's what we're going to go with for this. Um, so Paul's pretty much saying, why baptize? He's posing a question. Why baptize if you don't believe in the resurrection of humans or of Jesus? Verses 30 through 31, Paul's trying to explain the resurrection, how the resurrection shapes what it shapes who we are on a practical daily level. He mentions, I die every day. This is the key part. He is admitting and saying that he um, dies to the culture that is there right now. He dies to the rights and privileges that he was a Roman, but he was in Greece at the time. Um, the privileges and rights that he had as those were meaningless, and he was a Christian first off. Verses 32 through 34. This is Paul's call to action. If we claim the resurrection of the dead is false, then go and drink and don't worry about tomorrow. He's pretty much saying you can go do whatever the heck you want if you don't believe in the resurrection. But we know that not to be true, right? We know the resurrection to be true. He ends it with wake up from your, pretty much wake up from your sin, stop sinning, stop taking advantage of God's grace just because you're a Christian and you believe in specific stuff. Some may not know Christ, and our, heart, our hearts should cry out for them, right? We should, we, uh, he says, um, I say this to your shame. So clearly they were just taking advantage of it. They weren't trying to spread the gospel. And they really didn't have the gospel all set in stone because they had one major thing mixed up. So this whole section, um, I've kind of been all over the place because it's, it's, a, it's a hard section. Um, but the main point that I want you guys to get out of this is the resurrection of Christ eclipses all earthly happenings. So whatever we believe on this earth, whatever we do on this earth, whether he mentioned it, you know, um, earthly rights, earthly privileges um, within a specific government, uh, drinking, not worrying about what we do tomorrow, those are all earthly happenings. But the resurrection of Christ eclipses said things. So just a quick illustration for that. Um, 
I'm sure many of you, you know, ran for student council president or tried out for a sports team or joined a club and didn't get the position you wanted or something like that. The grand scheme of things, those things are pretty triv trivial to where we are at right now. I'm talking about like middle school. Um, you know, I don't think many of us go back and say, oh, I didn't make middle school, seventh grade basketball and I am distraught still. I don't think people think that way. Um, a complete 180. The resurrection should shape us in every single way possible. So those trivial things don't shape us by any means and we can move on with our lives, right? This resurrection is not a trivial thing as the Corinthians were trying to make it. It's not trivial. We need to have it shape us, and it should shape us if we're Bible-believing Christians every single day of our lives. <laughs> so finally, my last kind of tie together. So we talked about four major points, and I hope that these are the four major points that you guys can get out of this. So I use resurre resurrection or bust. Either the resurrection is true, and Christianity is true, or it's not. Um, resurrection, one-two punch. Either we resurrect along with Jesus, we have an eternal spirit, and so does he, or we don't, and he never resurrected. Reality check, God wins. That first event that happened was Jesus resurrecting, and God winning in the end. That was that jump start to God finally winning in the end. And finally, Jesus reigns. And the reason I say Jesus reigns is because Jesus reigns over all the her earthly happenings that we have on this earth, right? So I want to take a so we have those four points. And at, right now, you guys are probably thinking, I know people are thinking this, so what, Jack? Like, yeah, like, resurrection happened. I do believe I will go to heaven because I have faith in Jesus Christ. Um, I'm like, I, yeah, I agree with you too. Um, we know God wins. Yeah, I agree. That's what the Bible says. And um, Jesus reigns. Well, yeah, I think Jesus is reigning right now. I think Jesus has reigned forever. So, yeah, it's pretty easy, right? I want to take a look at why Paul is actually writing this in the first place. I hit on it in the second point in Resurrection 1-2 Punch. It's a culture norm at that time. Um, the culture norm in the, in the Corinthian church was that the resurrection of the dead wasn't real. Um, they didn't believe in anything that afterlife. They just believed you died. So um, he's writing it to address that culture norm to kind of take it out of what the church actually believes. So my main challenge is, I want you all to think, you know, what would Paul say to our culture today? Um, so we have, these, we have these main points that I said, you know, the resurrection of Christ, us resurrecting, and all this, all this stuff I just preached on. And we all agree on that because it's really easy to agree on it because those are core Christian values. But what would Paul say to our culture today? We live in, a, we live in America, arguably the greatest country ever in the history of ever, with endless rights. Honestly, though, like, it's funny, but it's true. You know, we have endless rights. Every single person in writing, you could argue, is equal. Um, there really isn't anything restraining us from doing anything or saying anything. Um, so what culture norms would he address? Um, it may not be the resurrection of the dead, like the Corinthians, but it may be something else. I can think of four right off the top of my head that bother me a lot, and I won't get in depth into them, but I do want to mention them. Um, the first is the perversion of sex in our society and in our culture. It's incredible. It's, it's, it's horrible, actually. Um, and you guys can say, well, you know, I, I know what sex is. I, I think it's great. I, th I think it's God-given, right? And I agree with you, but, like, people don't think that in our culture. The majority of people don't think that in our culture. Um, the second is the distortion between, uh, the distortion of the differences between men and women. Believe it or not, men and women are different. Um, we have different roles, and that's ver made very clear in, in the Bible. Um, Adam preached on it last week. Um, it's not that one role is better than the other. They're complementary. They need each other. And that is not accepted today. Um, again, we can, we can talk about it, but it's just, it's just not accepted, and it's moving farther away. The structure of the traditional family is, is crumbling. Um, whether you like it or not, as a Christian, you should believe that a man is the head of the house and a woman is right by his side ruling with him, and they should have a family. Um, I 100% believe that. I think that is very biblical, and that's not what's happening today. Um, we see that in a bunch of different ways, and I'm not going to get into those, but we all know what I'm thinking. And finally, the last is the value of human life in general. Um, I don't want to get too in-depth with it because I'm pretty passionate about it, but I just don't think that the culture respects human life as it did in the past or... Um, isn't it funny that we live in this culture that's arguably the greatest and the most prosperous ever, and we, we can't even value human life? I just, it's crazy to me. So what I'm trying to say pretty much is that we cannot let culture dictate what the truth is. 
And my last point, my last sentence, it's in the U version, and Nathaniel helped me with it. Cultures, cans, and cannots do not dictate God's truth. Whether we like it or not, the culture will never dictate what God and Jesus did for us, right? And I think we can all agree on that. I'm going to pray us out. Thanks, guys. Lord, I thank you so much for this time we have together. Um, thank you for using me to preach your word. I hope that someone here um, learned something more than just the basics of Christianity. Um, Lord, I thank you so much for sending your son to die for us and the ability to, you know, believe in that resurrection of the dead and believe in the resurrection of Christ. Lord, we know that God will win in the end. We know that Jesus is reigning right now until the end of time. And Lord, we thank you so, so much for that. In your name I pray. Amen.